Hello again and welcome back to statistics. Today we're in section 7.1 talking about properties of the normal distribution. We're going to start off talking about the uniform probability distribution, but what I really want to get to is the normal curve. So I'm going to show you how to graph a normal curve, we're going to talk about the properties of the normal curve, and we're going to talk about the role of area in the normal density function. This normal curve is something that we're going to be using throughout the rest of the course, so this is a very important section for us. It's not nearly as technical as it all sounds, so let's go ahead and get started. Now we're going to start off by looking at the uniform probability distribution, and although we don't usually see the uniform probability distribution in real life, this is going to help us establish a link between area and probability. So what we're doing is looking at a simplified example before we jump into the normal curve. This is example one from your textbook. It says, imagine that a friend of yours is always late. Let the random variable capital X represent the time from when you are supposed to meet your friend until he shows up. Suppose your friend could be on time, which means X equals zero, or he could be up to 30 minutes late, which means x equals 30. With all intervals of time between x equals 0 and x equals 30 being equally likely. For example, your friend is just as likely to be from 3 to 4 minutes late as he is to be 25 to 26 minutes late. The random variable capital X can be any value in the interval from 0 to 30. That is, 0 must be less than or equal to x, which must be less than or equal to 30. Now, I know that we have always looked at probability distributions as tables, but here we want to look at it as a histogram. So suppose that we put the values of the random variable on the x-axis, and we put the probability of each value on the y-axis. What would happen is that because all possibilities are equally likely, the probability histogram would look like a big rectangle. This is what it would look like. Notice that on the horizontal axis, we have all the values of the random variable from 0 to 30. So that represents the number of minutes late your friend arrives. On the y-axis, we have the probability of each value of the random variable. So there are 30 minutes between 0 and 30. Therefore, the probability that your friend arrives during any one minute is 1 30th. So we don't have the individual bars marked off, but each bar has a height of 1 30th. Notice that the area of the rectangle is 1, because remember the area of a rectangle is length times width. So the length here is 30, and the width is 1 30th. 1 30th times 30 is 1. So that's important that we notice that the area equals 1. This is called the uniform probability distribution because each of the bars is of uniform height. Now I know you'll remember that in section 6.1 we talked about discrete random variables. Many random variables are not discrete but continuous. The probability of your friend being exactly 24 minutes late is zero, and I know that might seem a little counterintuitive at first, but the probability of your friend being exactly 13.592 minutes late is also zero. In fact, the probability that your friend arrives at any one instant is zero. That's because we calculate the probability by the number of ways to observe any particular value divided by the number of possibilities, but because time is a continuous variable, the number of possibilities is infinite, and 1 divided by infinity would be 0. To get around this problem, we always compute probabilities of continuous random variables over an interval of values. For example, we might compute the probability that your friend is between 10 and 15 minutes late, but we would never try to calculate the probability that your friend is exactly 10 minutes late because that probability would be zero. To find probabilities for continuous random variables, we use a probability density function. 
like the uniform histogram we saw a couple of slides back. Now, a probability density function is an equation used to compute probabilities of continuous random variables. We will not ever see it as an equation, though. We will always see it as a graph. So don't worry about the equation part. But we do need to know that it satisfies the following two properties. The first is that the total area under the graph over all the possible values of the random variable must equal 1. The area under the curve equals 1. And the second property is that the height of the graph of the equation must be greater than or equal to 0. In other words, the graph can never dip below the x-axis. So the two big things to know are that the total area under the graph always has to equal 1, and the graph can never go below the x-axis. Now, this is a big deal. The area under the graph of a density function over an interval represents the probability of observing a value of the random variable in that interval. So here we see that an area is equivalent to a probability. Let's go back to the example we were working with before. What's the probability that your friend will arrive between 10 and 20 minutes late? Well, what we can do is mark off on our probability density function 10 minutes and 20 minutes, and we shade the area in between 10 and 20. The area of this rectangle is equivalent to the probability that our friend is between 10 and 20 minutes late. So how can we find the area of this rectangle? Well, because it's a rectangle, its area is just length times width. So let's say the probability of the random variable being between 10 and 20 is equal to the length times the width of the shaded area. Now it doesn't really matter which side you say is the length and which side you say is the width. Because this side looks longer, I'm going to call this side the length. So the length of our rectangle goes from 0 to 1 30th, therefore the length is 1 30th. And the width of our rectangle goes from 10 to 20. So we could say that the width is 20 minus 10. Now 20 minus 10 is 10, and 10 times 1 30th is 10 30ths, which simplifies to 1 -third. And the decimal equivalent of 1 -third is approximately 0 0.3333. So we could say the probability of our friend arriving between 10 and 20 minutes late is 0 0.3333. Now, I don't really want you concerned about the area of a rectangle. I don't really want you concerned about algebra or simplifying fractions. The big link that I want you to make here is that an area is equivalent to a probability. Now let's look at it the other way. Your friend is supposed to meet you at 10 a.m. and it's 10 a.m. now. There's a 20% probability that your friend will arrive within the next how many minutes? Well again, I want you to remember that there's a link between probability and area. You see the sum of all the probabilities is 1 and the area of the density function is also 1. So when they say there's a 20% probability, that translates to us as an area of 0 0.20. So let's make a rectangle that starts at 0, which is the time now, and goes to some unknown time t, and the area of that rectangle is 0 0.20. So again, note the link between area and probability. Now, we know that the area of this rectangle is length times width. And we also know that the area is equal to 0 0.20. So now we can say the probability that our friend arrives between 0 and t minutes is equal to 0 0.2. And 0 0.2 is the area of the rectangle, so that's going to be length times width. Now we know that the length is 1 30th, and we don't yet know the width. That's actually what we're trying to find. So the width of the rectangle is t minus 0, which is just t. Now 1 30th times t is going to be t over 30. 
And what we want to do is solve this equation for t. So again, I don't want you stressed out about solving the equation. What I want you to do is think about the link between area and probability. But we do want to isolate t here. So let's multiply both sides by 30. And on the left side, 30 times 0 0.2 will be 6. And on the right side, the 30s will cancel. So we'll end up with t equals 6 minutes. There is a 20% chance that our friend will arrive within the next 6 minutes. Now, most populations don't follow a uniform distribution. Many populations are what we call bell-shaped or symmetric. Now, the smaller we make the classes on a histogram, the more bars the histogram will have and the more it becomes outlined by one big curve. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Here is a histogram with five bars and we have a little curve that's drawn over the top of the bars. You can see that this curve is pretty much shaped like a bell, so that's where we get the name bell-shaped. And you can also see that the area under the curve is not exactly the same as the area of the histogram. See these big gaps between the curve and the histogram? If we had smaller bars, we could eliminate those. So here is the same histogram with more bars. Notice now that the gaps are not as large as they were because the area under the histogram now is more closely matched by the area under the curve. And if we had still more bars, the area under the curve would be very, very close to the area of the histogram. So from now on, instead of drawing histograms with individual bars, what we'll do is just draw one curve that represents all the bars of the histogram. Now we have a new word. A continuous random variable is normally distributed or has a normal probability distribution if its relative frequency histogram has the shape of a normal curve. That is, it's bell-shaped and symmetric. So normally distributed means that our distribution is bell-shaped and symmetric. Here is a normal density function, and you can see that it has that bell shape. Now, right in the center of the density function, we have the mean. You may remember from Chapter 3 that for bell-shaped data, the mean occurs in the center of the distribution. So here is a normally distributed variable, and right in the center of the curve we have mu. Now, mu plus one standard deviation and mu minus one standard deviation put us at what we call the inflection points. An inflection point is where the graph stops curving down and begins curving out. An inflection point is just where the graph changes the way it curves. So we see that the inflection points occur at mu plus one standard deviation and mu minus one standard deviation. Now the word normal in statistics does not mean typical like we use it in everyday conversation. It's not the opposite of weird. We're not talking about something normal versus something weird. Normal just means bell-shaped and symmetric. So curves with different means and different standard deviations can all be considered normal. Here is a normal curve with a mean of zero. And here is another normal curve with a mean of three. Both of these have the same standard deviation. They both happen to have a standard deviation of one. And you can tell that because the distance from the mean to the inflection point here is one. And on this red curve, the distance from the mean to both inflection points is 1. Here's another pair of normal curves. Both of these curves have a mean of 0, but the blue one has a standard deviation of 2. I can tell that because the distance from 0 to the inflection point is 2. But the red curve has a standard deviation of 1. And I can tell that because the distance from the mean to the inflection point is 1. Now we're going to talk about some of the properties of the normal density curve. And I think you'll be surprised 
how many of these you already are familiar with. The first point is that the normal density curve is symmetric about the mean mu. And if you think about the graphs that we've already seen, they all had mu right in the center, and the graph on both sides of mu was the same. So we know that the curve is symmetric about the mean mu. And the second point is that because the mean and the median and the mode are all the same for bell-shaped data, the curve only has a single peak and the highest point occurs at x equals mu. The third point is that we have inflection points at mu minus sigma and mu plus sigma. We already knew that. The fourth point is that the area under the curve equals 1. We already knew that. The fifth point is that the area under the curve to the right of mu equals the area under the curve to the left of mu. Both areas are 1 half, and that just makes sense. If the curve is symmetric about mu, that is, it's the same to the left of mu as it is to the right of mu, and the total area is 1, then it just makes sense that each half of the curve has to have area one half. And the sixth point is that as x increases without bound, that is, as x gets larger and larger, the graph approaches but never reaches the horizontal axis. And the same thing as x decreases without bound. The graph approaches but never reaches the horizontal axis. And this is another point that we already knew because we already found out that the graph can never go below the horizontal axis. And then the seventh property of the normal curve is the empirical rule. And you'll remember that we learned the empirical rule back in chapter 3. And the empirical rule just says that for bell-shaped data, approximately 68% of the area under the curve is between mu minus sigma and mu plus sigma. Approximately 95% of the area is between mu minus 2 sigma and mu plus 2 sigma. And approximately 99.7% of the area is between mu minus 3 sigma and mu plus 3 sigma. Here's a diagram to help us remember the empirical rule. 68% of the data occur within one standard deviation of the mean. Remember, the mean will be right in the center of the normal curve. So the middle 68% are within one standard deviation of the mean. The middle 95% are within two standard deviations of the mean. And the middle 99.7% are within three standard deviations of the mean. So within three standard deviations of the mean, we see almost 100% of the data. Now here is example three. This says this relative frequency distribution represents the heights of a pediatrician's 200 three-year-old female patients. The raw data indicate that the mean height of the patients is mu equals 38.72 and the standard deviation is sigma equals 3.17. So here we have a pretty large probability distribution or relative frequency distribution. The relative frequency of heights 29.0 to 29.9 is 0.005. The relative frequency of heights 30.0 to 30.9 is 0.005 and so on. And remember that if we add all the relative frequencies together we should get a sum of 1. Now here is a histogram that represents the data we saw in the relative frequency distribution on the last slide. And it says draw a normal curve with mu equals 38.72 and sigma equals 3.17 inches on the relative frequency histogram. Compare the area of the rectangle for heights 40 to 40.9 inches to the area under the normal curve for heights between 40 and 40.9. So a normal curve with mu equals 38.72 would be a symmetric bell-shaped curve whose highest point is at 38.72, so about right here. So here is our normal curve. So here is my normal curve, and you can see that the mean of this curve is occurring at approximately 38.72. And now let's mark off the heights from 40 to 40.9, and we'll shade in between those two marks. 
Now what they want us to do is compare the area under the normal curve between these two marks to the area of this bar from 40 to 40.9. And you can see that the areas are almost the same except for this little tiny corner of this bar. So the area of the shaded region is just slightly less than the area of that particular bar. And so one more time, we see the link between area and probability, or area and proportion. And now let's look at example four. This says the serum total cholesterol for males 20 to 29 years old is approximately normally distributed with mean mu equals 180 and standard deviation sigma equals 36.2. Draw a normal curve with parameters labeled. So we know that a normal curve is just a bell-shaped symmetric curve, and we know that it will have mu right in the center. So let's go ahead and draw that familiar bell-shaped curve, and right here in the center we'll have mu, which is 180. Now they gave us the standard deviation, and we know that the inflection points where the graph stops curving down and begins to curve out, these inflection points occur one standard deviation away from the mean. So if I say 180 plus 36.2, that puts my right inflection point at 216.2. And if I say 180 minus 36.2, that puts my left inflection point at 143.8. And there is our normal curve with parameters labeled. And then part B, an individual with total cholesterol greater than 200 is considered to have high cholesterol. Shade the region under the normal curve to the right of x equals 200. Okay, well if the mean occurs at 180 and the inflection point occurs at 216.2, then 200 occurs somewhere in between those two. So I'm just going to put right here a line to represent 200, and I'm going to shade everything to the right of that line that represents 200. So now we have shaded the region under the normal curve to the right of x equals 200. Now part C. Suppose that the area under the normal curve to the right of x equals 200 is 0 0.2903. Don't worry right now about where that number came from. They just gave it to us. Let's just take it. The area under the normal curve to the right of x equals 200 is 0 0.2903. Provide two interpretations of this result. Well, there are two different ways to think about this, and they're both important. The first thing we could say is that the proportion of 20 to 29 year old males with total serum cholesterol greater than 200 is 0 0.2903. In other words, we can expect that 29.03% of 20 to 29 year old males have a serum cholesterol greater than 200. The other way to think about it is in terms of probability. We could say that the probability that a randomly selected male 20 to 29 will have total serum cholesterol greater than 200 is 0 0.2903. So the area under the curve equates to proportion and it also equates to probability.